Warren, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate you coming, taking some time on being on Make Shit Happen show. What do you think about the name, first of all? Uh, first of all, I love it. I love it. Uh, that's one thing. If people know me, uh, my team, hey, I'm tell them, man, make shit happen. <laughs> Point <laughs> blank, period. Happen. We don't need excuses. Make shit happen. Warren, uh, now I know a little bit about you. You told me before the show that, you know, you were a far, you were in the military. Uh, how, how long did you serve in the military? Four years. Four, Four years. years. You grew up in Houston. Yes. What school did you go to over here? Uh, graduated from Willow Ridge. Now, let me ask you, what made you go to the military? Uh, I procrastinated, honestly, man. <laughs> uh, I, I signed up for the Navy, not even thinking about it two days before. Mm -hmm. And I was in the Navy literally in boot camp two weeks later. Uh, we, we appreciate your services. Thank you for serving our country. No problem. Uh, Warren, you, you came from the service. And you were a firefighter. Okay. How did, from being a firefighter, how did She's Happy Here came into existence? I mean, how did that happen? Uh, as a firefighter, you you know, most people don't know that you only work two days a week as a firefighter. Yeah. You work uh, 24 hours on, 24 hours off, 24 hours on, and then you're off for five days a week. Uh -huh. So most firefighters have a second job. Um, while I was working, what I would do for my second job is I would usually work at other fire stations as a second means of income. One of these days while I was working uh, as a second means of income at another station, my co-founder for She's Happy Hair, Marcus Bowers, called me and was like, I got a great idea. I was like, man, what you got? And he uh -huh. was like, uh, man, we should sell hair. And I thought that was the craziest shit ever <laughs> because, uh, man, we didn't know anything about hair. But he explained to me that somebody that he knew made $4,000 in a weekend selling hair. And I knew I was working 24 hours for $200. And at any given time, if the bell go off, I got to get on this fire truck and put my life on the line. So I owed it to myself. And 4000 sounded real good. Real good, man, <laughs> to not get burnt up, possibly. You know, for sure. So so, so that's how She's Happy Hair idea came in place. For sure. That, hey, you know what, we'll go ahead and sell some hair. Now, now tell me, I mean... How did you start it? I mean, what did you think about it? I mean, you you're not a woman, so you don't know a lot about hair. You just know that your auntie where had it, mom had it, right, you right. Know, their friends had it. So what what was the steps that you took to learn something about the product? Uh, polling, a lot of polling. I, I, at that time, after I got off the phone with him, I was like, I kind of got it in my head. Like I now I work for myself, right? I just okay. think if you fool yourself first, you can fool everybody else. So I would wake up in the morning, give me a good workout in, and I was living under the premise that if a man, a woman walks into a beauty, a barbershop, basically, if I'm getting my hair cut and a woman walks in there, she can ask us 50 million questions, man. We're going to answer all of them because we're happy to have a woman in our presence. Right. So I was hoping that that worked as well if, as if a man walked into a beauty salon. So I would literally walk into beauty salons and just ask women questions about hair. And it worked pretty well. So I'd spend hours in there just playing dumb. Not even playing dumb. I knew nothing about it, but I knew I had to learn about the product. So I would ask them, you know, what is this? What should it do? How much should it cost? How should it react? And I'd spend hours in each salon. And when I wore my welcome model, I seen I was kind of getting on people's nerves. <laughs> I'd get up and go to another one, man. And I drove around Houston. And in about three weeks of that polling of doing probably about two to three salons a day, I felt like I had enough you had some base kind knowledge. Of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, you had some kind of knowledge over there. So then what did you do? Uh, me and Marcus met up at uh, a good friend of ours house and uh, we put all of our money that we had together, which was a collectively $900. <laughs> and uh, we sent it to the World Wide Web. You know, uh, we didn't know a whole lot um, about like suppliers or anything. It was just uh, just going for it, just being fearless and going for it. So you bought. I'm assuming you bought hair product for $900. Yeah, we bought about $900 worth of hair care product. Now you bought this $900 hair product. Now what are you thinking? I got to sell it. Okay. I got to say, I got to make shit happen. <laughs> okay, make shit happen. <laughs> yeah, I got to make shit Tell happen. Tell us a little bit about that. So I would uh, walk into the same beauty salons and just walk in there with a duffel bag. Uh, if anybody ever watched Baby Boy and you've seen him try to sell the dresses, I just use that same premise. Like if I walk in these beauty salons and try to sell his hair, I'll just see what happens. So I'd walk in there, introduce myself. How y'all doing? My name is Warren. I'm here to sell y'all this hair. And I got laughed out of a lot of places. <laughs> uh, but I never let it discourage me. I just, you know, if they would laugh or tell me something, I'd always try to find a way to learn. Um, outside of walking in, just literally gorilla going in there and just trying to go to salon to salon, I'd wake up in the morning and utilize Craigslist. At this time, Craigslist was like a great place to market. It was a little safer than it is now. Yeah, a lot of people got real rich in Craigslist. Yeah, a real yeah. rich, man. So I'd get up and I'd probably put about 20 to 30 posts on Craigslist. Uh, beautiful hair, luxurious hair. Anything that I can come up with and put it there and call my phone number if you need it, we'll deliver it to your front door. And yeah. those were the marketing strategies. So now you were delivering to people's front door. All over Houston, Texas, yes. But Houston is a big city. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. And it was hot at that time. It was August. And I had a car with no AC. 
and uh, a terrible radiator. So a lot of times I sold uh, hair out the trunk of the car while my hood was smoking. A lot of times <laughs> the customers would be like, you all right? And I'd wave them off. And uh, one thing about that process, though, I never got discouraged. I remember I'd go and after, after my sale, I'd go and put like ice on the hood for my car to cool down. And i sit there and count my money and just be like, man, I'm going to tell a story one day. And I never got discouraged. Well, I always you're optimistic. Telling, you're telling the story right, right here. It's crazy. So, so, so you went, and I mean, Houston is hot. In summer. So not only your car was hot, I'm sure you were hot too. I was too. very hot. <laughs> very hot. Well, hey, that, that's good. So persistent pays off. Tell us a little bit. So now you, you know, you got the $900, you, you know, you, uh, you put in Craigslist, you go into the salons and everything. A lot of, and you're at, at that time, what, 30, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, 29, 30 years 29, old. 29, 30 years old. I mean, a lot of 29, 30 years old at that time, when they get this $900 they invested, now they made all this money, you know, they, they sometimes go crazy. Because you know we haven't seen money, so we want to go to the we want to go to the club, pop bottles, go to the Gucci store. I mean, what did you do? Um, we invested it right back into the company. You know, at that time, I still had a salary coming from the fire department, so I didn't need any extra money at that time. So every single dollar that we made from the company, we were in a position to put it right back into the company. Now, when you say we, it's you and Marcus. Me and Marcus. Okay. Yes. So tell us a little bit what. After that, what happened? You put you reinvested the money. What happens then? Uh, we reinvest, sell that inventory, reinvest, sell that inventory, reinvest, sell that inventory. And as time went on, a few months started to progress. Our customer base started to expand all over Houston. So I'm catching myself on my five days off, just driving all over the town. And women calling at one o'clock in the morning asking me to deliver a bundle. So it was like, we got to put some structure to this thing and kind of get a little business acumen better with it. So uh, understanding that we want to keep overhead low, we went ahead and found our first location, which was on the fifth floor of an office building. It was a 400 square foot room. Rent was only $400 a month, but we had a location that we could tell people to go to. And uh, we would go and get flyers printed up. And after the clubs let out, I'm out there at the clubs putting flyers on cars. I'm handing out all of my my uh routines that i would do as a single man at that time go to happy hours go to clubs it all went to business so when i instead of going out and try to talk to a woman i go and talk and then pitch the business instead of asking for a phone number i would give her a card for she's happy hair and it was confusion a lot of times because they thought i was trying to close a deal but the deal i was trying to close was a sale so every part of my life i started to dedicate to the business and uh we grew well, that's good. So what is next for She's Happy Hair? I mean, so what, what happened next after that? Uh, after you're that the, location. You're in the office building. We're in the office building, and uh, we're, we're getting women to come up there, and that's what we really honed our customer service. Our average ticket is about $243. So when you got a woman walking into a building uh, with hundreds of dollars in her pockets and expecting to see a woman, and you walk in there and you see me with all these tattoos, you know, you got to have great customer service. You got to hit them with a smile and bring them in and just try to make them feel warm and at home. So that's where we kind of developed our customer service skills. And uh, from that, we just decided to invest in marketing. Uh, we understood in our community, African-American community, you, you don't expect people to, even in business, you don't expect anybody to support you. Uh, you have to create a persona for your product and people only want to support things that are bigger than them. So we got on the radio and uh, soon after that, we, Still not getting paid from the company. We would take $1,800 and put that budget in the radio marketing. And then we... Of course, you got on urban radio. Of I'm course. I'm thinking overnights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, urban radio, a lot of overnights. Find the cheap slots uh, for sure. A lot of those $30 slots uh, just so people can hear us, just to get that name recognition out. So when did you open up your first storefront, like, you know, shopping center? It okay. was uh, in September of 2013. Okay, so we started the business when? August 2012. August 2012. We got the first, um, the suite was in December, mid-December okay. 2012. The first storefront that's on 16 in South Main to this day um, was on September of 2013. 2013. So now we have uh, about a year under our belt. You know, being in Houston, listening to the, you know, I listen to radio, you know, want to see what other advertisers advertise. I love your jingle. You know, she's happy here. Right. When did that come and how did that come about? Um, it came probably right around May, maybe of 2013. And uh -huh. uh, it came from a, a friend of mine at the time. You know, he um, loved what we were doing with the business. He seen the growth and he believed in everything that we were doing. And uh, he's a rapper. So he was like, man, I'm going to make a jingle for your song, for your business. And it was just like, man, whatever. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> so he was like really persistent, though. Like he called me and texted me like, hey, Warren, I need you to send me some information on the business. And I just never really took account to it because I'm focused on growing the business. And uh, I think one day 
he sent me a photo of a flyer. He's like, man, I went to the store. I got a flyer. I'm going to figure it out. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and uh, I had a Super Bowl party. He came with the CD. And he was like, man, this is the song. Check it out. And I was like, oh, man, thank you. I'm going to check it out. I still didn't check it out. He called me two days later. He's like, hey, man, you heard the song? And I let him know, like, man, I'm going to the movies by myself. I'm going to listen to it immediately when I get in the car. And uh, literally, man, when I put it on, I was just blown away. Um, by everything I called him immediately And I was just super excited I'm like man I'm gonna blow this up I'm gonna make this the biggest thing ever We gonna put money behind it And he didn't even believe me I guess like the energy had changed at that time and I was like I'm telling you man I'm gonna blow it up And uh, we just went very aggressive uh, On the radio advertising yeah. with it And uh, it definitely laid the foundation for us Yeah I mean you know that that's I think I will say that advertising Radio advertising with the powerful music like that I mean put you on the You know put you on Put you on notice Right I mean you know because because the hair industry, you know, prior to, you know, I'm sure there's other people of color and other people doing it, but not on a big scale. And I mean, you know, when you went commercial with it, I mean, there's a lot of, it was dominated by a lot of Asians and, and uh, you know, um, Korean people. So you being the person of color and being a man in this, you know, in a women industry, how did you, what did you think about that? You know, and, and how did you... Uh, you know, you know, there was some obstacle. How did you overcome them? Uh, from day one, it was just like, and at this time, this was like at the beginning of reality TV. So this yeah. was the beginning of basketball wise. So I seen that every woman wants to feel like that. So it's like if we can provide a product and sell them that persona, and even when this is when social media was fairly new, Instagram was new, every one of our photos on Instagram was a customer of me writing the post, look at the beautiful customer with the luxurious hair, treating our customers like stars, mm -hmm. understanding that it's not about us. Um, probably for the first five years of the business, nobody even knew who I was for sure. Like I just stayed in the background and we made sure to keep the customers at the forefront of the business and that's one thing right now that's still important to us even on our tv commercials all of them they're, they're not professional models they're literally she's happy customers uh because we understand we're nothing without them yeah and, and that's i mean that's one thing good that you know you should always a businessman should always know that we are nothing without our customers customers are our bosses they pay our bills they pay everything now now i know you had a lot of trials and error because you were not in the hair industry you were not a professional I mean, you just you just did your course by going to by by going to all these uh, salons and and asking the customers. I know there got to be some L's on the way, and and there was some mad customers who were not happy about the product. Right? How did you overcome that, and how did you take care of that? Um, any customer complaints, man? We just learn from them. You know, we are we're, we're male in a female dominated business. So ideally, our customers are going to be more informed than us. So any complaint is a learning opportunity for us um, because we want the business. We don't want anybody to feel dissatisfied. Um, so many L's along the way, bringing wrong people, um, giving up equity when you shouldn't give up equity, uh, making just a lot of novice business mistakes uh, because I didn't come from a business background. I just had the heart of an entrepreneur and always wanted to try it. So um, also learning that you just got to read up. You got you to go to every seminar you can, read every book you can, because business is tough. And if you got a product that's hot, that's not a business until you can kind of make it a sustainable one. Well, you know, like we, we talked about L's over here. Everybody, when they see it, they say, you know what, man, this, oh my God, this store is making so much money. I got to do something like that. And they see the W's only. They don't see the L's. Tell me something about the L's. Um, You know, you got to understand when, when you're in the any business, you're the last to get paid. Uh -huh. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the customers get paid before you. Uncle Sam gets paid before you. Uh, sometimes you don't. Uh, we've opened up locations in smaller cities and closed locations in smaller cities. We've brought on the wrong type of people that's stolen, uh, that's tried to mimic the brand, that's tried to mimic the business model. Uh, we've had employees that came in and kind of stolen from us and learned from those lessons. I think as uh, in life, an entrepreneur in life general, you just got to get used to the L's. You got to embrace them and you got to own up to them. You know, you got to find a way to find some fault in it on yourself and have that humility that way. And then you have to take the accountability to change that behavior. Uh, and every L is different and you're going to in there and it's impossible not yeah. to lose. Yeah. Impossible. Now you touched on something and, you know, uh, I was on a podcast uh, on this flex coach uh couple of weeks ago and you know there's one question that he asked me how do you deal with people 
when they take, you know, when they come to you and they want to learn from you, they act like they're your friend. They act like they are compassionate towards you and all that other stuff. But in reality, they're there with their own agenda. How do you deal with something like that? Um, man, you gotta, you gotta put, you gotta put the pressure and gotta say, you know, discourage you. So how do you deal with the, that? The first time, probably the first few times was very discouraging because uh -huh. it, you just weren't looking at it from a business mindset. It was more emotional and you got to learn not to have an emotional attachment or emotional reaction. Uh, I just look at it like this, man. I, I, I honestly feel like I'm here to inspire people. And those people were inspired by you. Despite their intentions, despite how they went about it, they were inspired by you. So when somebody comes as a man and sells hair, you can imagine how many people try to mimic it and get close to me and figure out what, what I'm doing in secret sauce and try it again. I don't give them any energy, man. I wish them well. Um, and uh, I just know that I'm here to inspire people. So you can't decide how people will use that inspiration. Yeah. Everybody don't have the purest heart. You know, one of my favorite lyrics out of a rap verse was like, I hope your opportunity survives the opportunists. Because you got to know when you be make an opportunity that, that people start looking at or become successful, the opportunities are going to come. So, and you cannot afford to give them that energy back. You got to keep going. The marathon continues. You got to just got to stick on the way. Usually they'll take care of themselves anyway. Well, we have a lot, we have something in common because my answer was along the same line. And, you know, I told him, you be you, you know, don't, you know, don't focus on them because people are going to come take advantage of you. You just be you. So, I mean, you know, we had a very similar answer. And, I mean, you know, I'm kind of glad we we on the same wavelength over right. there. And, you know, being in business, there's so many challenges every day. Every day. Every day. And, I mean, you got to have your core team. You got to have your team. Tell me a little bit about your team. How do you form your team? What do you think about, I mean, you know. Well, that? initially, uh, it was me and Marcus when we started. Uh, then I started to add. I, I just felt like when I attain some success i owed it to the people around me like i don't want to be successful the people around me are so i brought in a lot of people that were close to me and added them on the core team some are still here uh some were opportunists you know and we took big l's and lawsuits and all of that uh from them and right now when i'm adding people on the team i got a great people and anita and um you know a lot of my managers uh i just look for people who are culture fit people who are hungry you know, uh, work ethic is everything to me. I don't mind failing. Failing is a part of it. I just want people who are loyal and who are willing to, like, go into the trenches with me. And also, when you're building your team, find people who are good at not what you're good at, right? So, you said failing is a part of it, you know, and everybody should face failure. Like, if you have to say common, like, mistakes, what do you, are mistakes failure? Yes. Why? Sure. Um... Because you're taking an L. <laughs> yeah, you're taking an L, man. Yeah, He's, for sure. You know, well put right there. Yeah. You know, because I feel like mistakes are, you're going to make mistakes, learn from them. Right. That's it. They are failures. Yeah, yeah. Learn from them. Right. Get better. Right. So what is next for She's Happy Here? Uh, growth. Growth. Uh, online presence. We're trying to blow up our online presence uh, right now. By I know the way. you just had something big that happened. In Walmart. In Walmart. So, so yeah, tell us yeah. A we bit just signed that. a big deal with Walmart. So uh -huh. that's kind of like the huge thing signing with the Walmart retailer. Uh, they actually opened up each and every Walmart across the nation for us and uh, allowed us to go in and any retail stores that are open. We opened up our first one in Atlanta with Atlanta being the hair mecca. If anybody knows anything about Atlanta, it's the hair mecca. And it, luckily in our um, in urban culture, it's kind of like the culture mecca now with Tyler Perry Studios. So we felt like that was the first stronghold that we needed to kind of set the standard for the industry. Um, after we leave Atlanta, we have a six store deal in three years with Walmart. So we plan on going to Chicago. We plan on going to Miami, D.C., LA and New York, uh, just expanding the brand as much as possible, scaling as much as possible, uh, and embracing all of the new failures and, um, you know, mistakes that we're going to make upon that journey and hopefully learning from the scaling we've done thus far. That's so, that's so good. Uh, is there, a, if there is an inspirational message or some kind of message that you want to give to the entrepreneurs or as inspire, aspiring entrepreneurs who are listening to this? What will be one message about failure? Embrace it. Embrace it. Don't run away from it. And don't run away from it. And I think a lot of times in entrepreneurship, you want to, you don't want to admit to failure because uh -huh. you don't want to feel like one. So it's <laughs> like, oh man, I ain't mess up. It ain't that bad. But it's like, if you don't face that head on and look at that and have some self accountability and see like it was my fault and change that behavior, uh -huh. that thing will mess around and cripple your whole business. If you allow, if you allow it to fester. So you got to embrace it. You literally have to just say, I'm going to walk through this thing. Failure to failure to failure to failure. Because if you don't take five L's, you ain't going to get no W. <laughs> and, uh, and if you know anybody who got a W, they go tell you that all day long. That's awesome. 
Guys, you just heard part one of our inspiring show with Warren Broadnecks. Please tune into part two, and we have a lot to talk with Warren on that. This is such a, such a positive, inspiring interview. I hope you join us in part two.